Hello, everyone. And today we're talking with John Olson, who is an author of multiple genres. But what we're going to be talking to him about right now is some of his more recent projects uh, and, and a number of things that you're apparently involved in. So <laughs> tell me, John, first off, what genres do you write? I know of science fiction and fantasy. Is that it? Or I think there's a lot more. Well, there's science fiction is probably my primary focus right now, but yeah, there's fantasy, there's steampunk, kind of a subgenre in there. I've done some horror short stories and urban fantasy, uh, a lot of different things. Short stories is kind of where I do my experimentation. And I've kind of heard that you're supposed to like focus on one genre so people know what to expect from you. And, well, I don't listen very well. I also have one that's a historical military fantasy. So, yeah, I'm all over the place on genre. I'll admit, I keep hearing that one genre thing, and it's so funny. Many times I hear people say, oh, stick to one genre, is people that have been successful in multiple genres. <laughs> so I, I, I'm kind of with you on that one. I'm not sure. But, I mean, right now you've been working on, like you say, science fiction is kind of where you're at right now, and you're working on – uh, the Polcat Protocol. So that is, I guess, the big project of the moment. So tell me, what is the basics of the Pro Polcat Protocol? That's a tongue twister, too. <laughs> Well, yeah, it, it's a project I had a lot of fun putting together. Um, the basic premise is it starts out with some space miners on a very small moon, very isolated location, and through a disaster, they are cut off from outside contact. And so they have to go into survival mode because, you know, if the power goes out, they're all going to die. And so it starts off with a very stressful environment. And so they discover a little bit more about what's going on. And so that is kind of what happens in the first book is that survival and discovery story. And then it continues on after that. Yeah, you know, kind of a little bit of a spoiler. They do survive because there's you know a book two and a book three. Okay, so it's coming out as a trilogy. Yeah. So is that I, if I remember correctly, the first one's out already? Actually, all three are out. I did kind oh, of a rapid there. release on those uh, every two, maybe three months. So not a super rapid release. The first one came out uh, late summer last year, and the last one was in January. So all three of those are out now. Okay, so they've all come out. And I know you did an introduction with uh, Adaptive Reasoning, which is a collection of your short stories, Um that deal all with science fiction. But I'm going to get to that in a moment because what I'm kind of wondering about is the Polcat protocol a little bit more. So it's the survival mode. So what was your inspiration? What draw you to do in that story? It seems like there's there's a little bit more of a backstory to that one. Well, it turns out that since I was a teenager, I have been a huge fan of Andre Norton and her books. Uh, she did a lot of uh, things that were related to science fiction as well as fantasy, and so I kind of get that from both sides there. She's got both her witch world stuff and some of the other science fiction stories that she's done, so uh, I've been a, a huge fan for ages, but I've also read a bunch of uh, Isaac Asimov and other things like that that are the old school science fiction classics. And so they were a great inspiration to me. And I liked approaching this from more of a hard SF uh, aspect where the science is pretty rigorous because, well, I'm a software engineer by trade. And so, yeah, give me a rule set and I kind of run with it. Okay. So, so, but what about the survivalist aspect? So we got the science fiction background of where it all came from, but why a survivalist story? Um, I thought it would be interesting to put people in a situation where they had very few limited options on what they could do uh, to improve their situation. They have very few resources, and that's part of the story is what can they do with those limited resources? And so, yeah, it turns out that uh, the whole series of the Polcat Protocol is named after some information that one of the miners uh, had accidentally discovered. 
because, well, she wasn't supposed to be nosing around in those things. And so she found something that is a resource that they can use uh, to uh, improve their chances of survival. Okay. So that's that's rather interesting. Uh, it's kind of sneaking around there a little bit. So now I'm going to jump back to your, your anthology, Adaptive Reasoning. Now, the reason why I want to go to this one first is because the last... If people are interested in finding out a little bit more about the Polcap protocol, the last entry in your anthology there is chapter one of the Polcap. Right. Yeah, I had eight individual short stories, and then I had the one uh, first chapter introduction to the series. One of the reasons I put the adaptive reasoning set together was to introduce people to my writing style so they could get kind of a, a cross story flavor for what my writing is like and introduce them to the series and say, well, if you liked the short stories here, well, here's a series that I'm hoping you're going to love as much as I loved writing it. Okay. So who would you say these are all kind of directed to as your main audience? Um, probably a technically oriented reader, but I do have a lot of the emotional appeal in there. It's not like you have to have a degree to read these things. Uh, I like to make them very personal as well, but I, I do like to sprinkle in some of the tech, some of the science and make things work that way. Uh, for example, the first four stories in adaptive reasoning all happen to revolve around the same suit of mechanized armor. And so I had a lot of fun with that one because I knew what the armor was, I knew what the armor could do. And then I thought, oh, okay, what kind of personal elements can I make different between each of these stories? And so that's where I kind of have this two-sided approach where, yeah, here's the nuts and bolts and here's the people. And I kind of get them to uh, intermingle in interesting ways. Yeah, I did like those first stories, but I'll admit, I love anthologies that all kind of, you know, match up. An, an old fan of Sanctuary and Thieves World. <laughs> so on the mechanized armor, I was going to actually ask you about this because it was an interesting thing. So many times we see these stories about mechanized armor and we think of, you know, the big robot jocks and all this, but you went very, like, minimalistic in the armor of what it could do. This is not the big battle bots that we'd expect to see in, you know, like uh, Pacific Rim. So right. Why did you want to scale that back to that that lower level, kind of getting a little bit more gritty, you might say, into what, what it was all about? Well, it's another one of those cases where I wanted the people to be in peril. If you're in this invincible suit of armor marching around, uh, there isn't a lot of peril involved and people think, oh yeah, you can do just about anything in that suit. And so I came up with this idea of a suit that's kind of bulk manufactured. Uh, maybe the quality control isn't as good as it ought to be. The artificial intelligence is actually part of your helmet instead of part of the suit. Uh, it has a limited set of rockets and a limited set of uh, bullets that it can uh, fire through a, a machine gun. And that's just about it. And so the story starts out as a reconnaissance uh, mission on the very first story. And so it's one of those cases where I didn't want to be tromping through making giant footprints. I wanted it to be a little bit more stealthy. And so that first uh, story kind of set the tone with what the suit was like, making it a little bit smaller. It's still kind of large, but it's not nearly the kind of mech suit that you uh, see going into these giant battles and smashing each other around. And so it does give it that much more personal feel where the person in the suit takes a bigger role. So it brings it out from the, the mechanization to the, the human aspects. Right. And that series of it was four stories, and that also included some that had never been published before. Right. So this is the first place that people have read your stuff before. They can't find it anywhere but here. <laughs> yeah, I think that was two right and here. two out of those first four stories, where two had been published and two were uh, new ones. Yeah. And then the rest of them, I believe, were from other anthologies that you've done, some other works. Um, 
Yeah, there's uh, a lot of different things. One of them, uh, the order of things, that was an interesting one because it was a shared universe where I had to follow somebody else's rules in order to write the story. Uh, they had their own governmental organizations, their own settled planets, all of those sorts of things. Playing around in somebody else's sandbox can be a lot of fun. So that's one of the things that I did there. I think... Uh, there's also three strikes, uh, last chance, retirement plan. Some of them are very much more a people story, and the tech really does take much more of a, a background on there. Uh, let's see, one of those, uh, trying to remember which is which on here. That's one of the things about writing so many stories is I'll send a story off to some short story market and I'll get a rejection back. And I have to think now, wow, what story was this? I'll have to go through and look up. Oh, that's the one I sent to them. Then I have to look and make sure, oh, that's that story. Okay. And so it's kind of interesting to get into that mode. It really, uh, I hear it's, that some authors, uh, I started out this way myself, but they get very anxious about those rejections. But I got to the point where if I get a rejection, it's just, oh, okay, well, I'll go through, find another place to send it, send it off to somebody else because they might want to publish it. And so when I have to look through here, even looking at the titles of the stories, I have to stop and think, now, which one was that? I, I can, I understand that. So you're talking about you've worked in a shared universe. Now, this is a was it one that the people came together and created, or is this an intellectual property that's already had multiple other things already out there? Uh, that one was, I think, just for the anthology, they came up with a, a okay. kind of a universe Bible and said, here's what all of these stories need to adhere to. Right. And so it wasn't a, a pre-existing intellectual property. I think it was just for... There may have been a couple of novels as well in that space, but it was primarily introduced through all of these short stories. Okay, because I've talked to some other people who have worked in other intellectual properties of people, and they, they talk about there's a real difference between having your own creativity in your <laughs> own universe versus working in someone else's universe and in intellectual property. So what did you see was the big biggest difference for you as a challenge in doing that, working in somebody else's universe? Well, I think it was more of a challenge on the novel that I did that with. It's the historical military fantasy. Uh, it's called High Hopes, where uh, it's a universe that's set on Earth, and a lot of the stories that are uh, written are modern-day military stories. I decided I wanted to do World War I. And so it, it took me a lot of research to combine okay, how did warfare work in World War I with biplanes versus what's the story Bible say about this organization of uh, military people who are out fighting monsters? How do those things all go together? And so it was kind of this multi-tiered thing where I had to get my research right from several different angles at once. And that was kind of challenging to make sure I had my organizational uh, things right for the military at large and for this joint task force uh, that uh, actually one of the research things that I discovered is they weren't called joint task forces in World War I. So I had to come up, okay, where is the actual name this kind of a group would have? There's a lot of research in there that it's not just the shared world. Uh, because you have to make sure it's the shared world and everything that's adjacent to it that might be the real world at that particular time. Okay, so you have one other series of books out before the Polecat Protocol, and that was a fantasy setting. Yeah. Now we've moved into a science fiction setting. Uh, did you find that transition hard to do, or because of all the other short story work you did, was it something that just kind of flowed for you? Well, funny thing about that is I did an analysis, you know, back to being the gearhead I am. Uh, I did an analysis of 163 short story submissions to figure out where my success was. I broke it down by year and by genre. And it turns out there were 11 categories that I wrote in. If you kind of carve out poetry as its own kind of a genre, but not quite. And... Uh, 
there was one year I was focusing on submitting a lot of fantasy short stories. Turns out that year I sold more science fiction stories by accident than I did fantasy stories on purpose. And so I went in to look at all this information. I thought, well, maybe it's my voice lends itself more to the technical kind of a story, the science fiction, the modern terminology, modern uh, methods of speech than fantasy. And so that's why I decided I was going to focus on the science fiction. Uh, I really enjoy fantasy and I've read a lot of both science fiction and fantasy, but that kind of is one of those influences that steered me is looking at what the differences were in my short story successes. Okay. So you actually went back and truly analyzed where you were successful and found your voice based in that. I right. think that's, I just want to make a point of that because I know I get some newer writers watching these and that is something that's really hard to say is, you know, finding your own voice, writing what you know. And you're telling Nair right now, you did that through your own analytical stasis, but you realized who you are was coming through in your writing. Yeah. And so if I really focus on that, now I know what to look for. And so if I go back and do fantasy, I can approach it a little bit differently and see if I can address that particular thing that I wasn't looking at so much before, but now I know to look for it. Okay. So that's a good writing tip, I think, you know, to kind of share with people. So let's move on to the next project you got coming up. I guess you're putting, you got the behind you there, the solar system. And I know you did some work in the planetary anthologies. And I guess now that they've gone out of print, you're picking up some of that work and, and reintroducing those shorts? Yeah, it's been an interesting project. It just released um, a week ago yesterday. Uh, so it's out on Amazon and Kobo and Apple Books and uh, Nook. And so it's the uh, the best of the Planetary Anthology series. Uh, it's kind of got an interesting story behind the whole series because it started out at one publisher. That publisher uh, went defunct. I think uh, one of the owners had passed away or something unfortunate there. Another publisher jumped in and said, okay, we're going to finish the series. They went through and uh, did like the last two thirds of the series. Uh, it's 11 different books. Uh, then they ended up needing to uh, take it uh, out of print. And I contacted the publisher and said, so what about if I put together a best of collection? And so I ended up picking two stories from each volume. So it's 22 stories. It's a really big anthology. Uh, it's like 150,000 words. Uh, that's one of those weird things is I would measure things in words. Some people measure them in pages. And I'm not really good at translating between the two. But yeah, it's about the size of two novels uh, for your typical uh, science fiction sort of a novel. And so, yeah, I picked that up and ran with it. The publisher was kind enough to give me access to all of the original documents and the cover art. And so it was a great help in putting things together. I ran all of the stories through a new edit pass to kind of make them uniform so they all looked like they belong with each other. And I've got some great names in there. I've got Jody Lynn Nye, Kevin J. Anderson, John C. Wright, and his wife, uh, lots of different people that uh, have contributed to some great stories in there. But one of the other cool things is the very last story in it is also the very first published story for a particular author that lives, I think, down in the Bay Area. And so we've got the whole gamut in there from these heavy hitters all the way down to, yeah, this is the new guy that wrote an awesome story. So this isn't your first time you've been editing. I know that. Um, right. But what would you say is the, do you prefer being the writer or the editor? <laughs> um, I think it depends kind of on the mood and the time. Uh, sometimes I like to get in and do some editing like this. Other times I really want to crank through and get some of my own stories out there. You know, I also edited uh, another anthology. I think you reviewed one of the Mormon steampunk anthologies. Uh, that was just one of those crazy ideas somebody had and it uh, turned into a four book series, amazingly enough. But Editing anthologies 
is a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun as well. Yeah, it turns out I've also been editing other people's novels for a couple of the uh, local small presses. And so, yeah, editing is kind of integrated into what I do. And the really cool thing with the editing is it helps me to write a better first pass uh, when I'm doing my own writing as well. And so it's not like it's completely turn off one side of the brain, turn on the other side of the brain. Uh, they kind of connect into each other a lot. And so there's a lot of crossover when I am doing the editing versus the writing. So it kind of like being involved in a critique group almost, uh, <laughs> where you're giving the critique and then learning from what you've given other people to tell to improve your own writing. Definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, times where I'll give somebody some feedback and think, oh, you know, I didn't do that very well in this uh, other thing I'm doing here. I need to improve that too. Uh, but that's one of the cool things about the uh, writing community is I've gotten to know a lot of great people, whether they are uh, authors or editors or agents or publishers or whoever. Uh, there are a lot of people out there who are willing to uh, give of their time and help other people because it isn't a case where if, you succeed with your writing. I'm going to fail with mine. Every time you sell something, I'm not going to. It doesn't work that way. We can all grow together because the idea is we want a lot of avid readers out there. We want a lot of new readers out there. And we have the opportunity to help each other to find these new readers and to encourage people to get into a lot more reading and enjoy what they're doing. Okay, yes. So I'm going to take a little bit of a bend here now, because I do know you're also a tabletop role playing game and probably <laughs> online games, too, with what I know you do as a living. Not um, so much now, but yes, I have been rather extensively <laughs> involved. Yep. So you've, you've you've been out playing games, building stories that way also. Have you ever thought about writing a role playing game or writing adventures for others? I have thought about it, but I haven't really gotten into the module development very much. Um, that's an area that I've kind of kicked around some ideas, but I, I really haven't taken it too seriously. Uh, uh, you also do a lot of board game stuff. And so I was putting together some rough ideas that I had for, oh, does this kind of a card game work? And so I was doing some prototyping with it and the mechanics seemed to work, but it just wasn't very fun yet. And so I'm missing something in there. So yeah, maybe I'll have to do a little consultation with you of what makes <laughs> a card game or a board game awesome. <laughs> I'll try to help where I can. But another, <laughs> kind of another question along with the, the gaming side of things. Have you ever stolen from your game to include it in a book or into a story? I mean, um, Brandon Sanderson talks about where he's done that, where he'll run something in his game and he was the rule of cool. And if it really worked, he'd rework it and put it in one of his books. Have you? Yeah, have that, that can happen. Um, there was one particular campaign. It wasn't me who wrote it, but uh, one particular campaign, a friend of mine, uh, Melissa, decided this character is a lot of fun. They have to be in a book. <laughs> and so uh, she had this... Um, kind of a uh, death priest character. And your typical image of a death priest is uh, doom and gloom, all darkness and moody and uh, the evil kind of black character. Uh, everything's all dark and that they are the hateful. No, she played it up straight as this is a part of life. Everything is great. I help people on their way. Uh, and she, she just lightened up the whole thing uh, emotionally uh, to where it was a really interesting look into things. And so that character ended up in a book because she thought it was so interesting to play this character that approached being a uh, servant of the god of death from a positive spin. Okay. So those things happen. Yeah. So that's a yeah, I that's something that recently came up in some things I was doing, uh, some panels that they were talking about using games for creating story and book. And that's the reason why I was asking that, because I had some people following up saying, Well, who really does that? I'm going, 
most writers I know, and you haven't been the next one I'm interviewing. So <laughs> thought I, well, I also that. have friends that are getting more into the RPG lit. And so it's tying in writing in a format like a game. And so that's a whole different ball of wax there. Yeah, the stories that are characters know they're in a game. Uh -huh. I'm just finishing up one of those books right now. With someone have your crew. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've got two friends that are doing series along those lines. Oh, okay. So now we've finished up with the writing. Now we've got the planetary anthologies, and I guess they're coming out. Some of them's kind of maybe started, and they're coming out throughout this year. Is that correct? Well, the, well, the planetary, the best of the planetary anthology, it's one volume that I have put okay. together, and that's the one that came out, I think, eight okay. days ago. I misunderstood then, because I was thinking you're doing more than one. So you took all those huge amounts and down to just one volume yeah i pulled two stories out of each volume so it's 22 stories in one cover okay that's great so you've been keeping yourself busy and it sounds like oh we've got through everything that's been published what are we looking towards in the future from john olson well, I've got two things that I'm kicking around as ideas, and I'm using uh, a few short stories as kind of a palate cleanser to, to figure out where I want to go next on things. Um, I could take my Polecat Protocol universe and do another set in that universe. Uh, there's another idea that I'm kicking around that is a uh, post-apocalyptic breakdown of a galactic civilization. And so it's something where there's these scattered pockets of people uh, around throughout the universe in various places, and they're trying to put things back together. And so each individual planet is going to be mostly isolated, and people are trying to recover their technology. Uh, that's uh, an area where it's really interesting to me because I love uh, stories where it's kind of an underdog who steps up uh, to accomplish great things. I like those positive stories with the uh, really rich emotional payoff. And so if I can take somebody who's down on their luck and turn them into a hero, it's kind of the opposite of the chosen one kind of a story where you know, okay, that's the kid with the prophecy and he's going to do amazing things. You don't start off knowing that as the person who is going to save the universe. Uh, it's, well, yeah, they're uh, having a hard time, and, well, they might make it through this hard time, but what's next? And so it gives an interesting feel to it that way, where you're uh, following something that isn't predestined. Okay, and I do know in case people haven't read in York before, it's all very family-friendly, too. Yeah. So you don't have to worry about language and description. So we're really good that route. Yeah, that's one of the things that I like about the publisher for my uh, fantasy series is they like to limit everything to a PG-13 or milder, and that fits my writing style very well. And so even with my science fiction stuff that I have self-published, I keep that same kind of an outlook. Okay. So that gives people an idea that it's something that they could get for their kids and not have any problem. So outside of the writing aspects... I know you've been involved before with the League of Utah Writers, mm -hmm. uh, very heavily in different ways. Uh, you know, I, I think chapter president before, um, and you've been the league president for a year during the pandemic when everything was like, ah! <laughs> yeah, I actually have a pocket watch that on the back of it is engraved, the pandemic president. There you go. Okay. So, but what do you have coming up? I've heard that you're going to be doing some more things with or for the League of Utah Writers. So. Yeah, I'm still involved with the League. I'm still on the executive committee until August. And there are always volunteer opportunities with the League and I'll still be involved in doing things at some level there. Uh, I've, I've still been a member of the uh, local chapter here and helping out with doing things there. I did a presentation a couple of months back. Uh, so. It's one of those things where I love opportunities to 
uh, give back some of the things that I've been able to learn to hopefully help somebody else along on their journey as a writer. Um, it's not like I'm Brandon Sanderson success level or anything, but you know, every one of us has things that we can share. Uh, and so I love finding those things and sharing with other people. And so I attend a lot of different conferences and give presentations and I'm on panels and things like that. And I enjoy doing that to share those things that I've been able to pick up along the way. And with the league, it's kind of the same thing where, uh, I'm helping out with a lot of different things. One of the things that I'm going to be spearheading is a fundraiser uh, that's going to probably be toward the end of July, uh, just as we go into our big uh, conference uh, in August. And so there are a lot of different things that I'll be involved in there uh, as I'm moving through my uh, term as the official past president. So that's on that level, but what about uh, presentations for the league? Um, prequels is coming up in April. Right. And I believe you were saying, we were talking before, and you have several uh, presentations. So if people want to learn more from you, uh, right. Prequels is a league-sponsored event, uh, being a hybrid online, and there's the keynote speaker in person, uh, letting them know about that. One of the right. things I always enjoyed about prequels is the cost of it makes it affordable to basically anyone and anywhere because you can watch all these presentations. And I gotta say, I've got a presentation in there too. So, uh, <laughs> well, we won't talk about that so much, but just as a disclaimer, but. Tell me, what presentations, what can people look for uh, from John Olson, from you, as a presenter uh, coming up in these pre-recordings? These pre yeah, for, for prequel, it's really interesting because we used to always do everything live, but uh, because of the pandemic, we figured out, oh, you know what? We can pre-record a bunch of these and just do certain sections of it live. And so it's different because somebody who signs up for this really inexpensive conference doesn't have to pick, well, I can only see four things because of the time slots they're in. No, you can look through every single one of those videos now. And so the three that I have pre-recorded for the prequel conference are a copy editor cheat sheet and then care and feeding of your Amazon author account and outlining and story structure. So I've got three different presentations there. And I have, uh, I actually had given the Amazon author account presentation before, but I re-recorded that because Amazon had has changed the layout of some of the things that they are doing recently. So I wanted to make sure that information was current. Well, that's really good. So there's some good information people can go and help them build themselves, not only as a writer, but also as an editor and also as an author. Right. Yeah. Even if you just want to write books and you don't want to like edit other people's stuff, you still need to know enough about editing to give your editor or uh, whoever you're submitting it to a nice, clean copy. And so that's where things like this copy editor cheat sheet work really well is because it's not just for people that are out to work as an editor. OK, so we're kind of we've come up for about a half hour right now, but I want to still go and ask you one other thing, because. When I talk to people, you know, it's like when I, depending on their field, if you come across someone that is a new writer, someone that wants to be an author, what advice would you give them as you know that they're just starting out? I think one really critical thing is to finish something. It doesn't have to be great. It doesn't have to be a phenomenal thing that's going to make you world famous. It just has to be done because you can't edit a blank page. And so it, if you want to write things, figure out, okay, I've got a budget of maybe 4,000 words. That's a fairly ordinary size short story. Um, if you can just figure out how to get from the beginning through the middle to the end, type the end on that story, then you have something that you can work with and you've already accomplished something that a lot of people never get to. Uh, you will have actually written a story instead of be one of those people where oh, I think I'd like to do that someday. No, you've actually done it. So that's probably the biggest thing that I would say to somebody who is just looking at getting into writing. Okay. And what you're saying is it doesn't really matter the quality, just that it's done. 
Right, because you can edit things, you can change things, but if you don't have anything down yet, there's nothing to edit and nothing to change. Okay. Anything else you would like to share with us about what you've been doing or have done? And... Well, I've been having a lot of fun with the, the short stories that I'm playing around with, uh, trying to figure out, oh, am I going to stick with science fiction? I think I'm going to be doing that. But um, I also have been trying to figure out, well, maybe I ought to uh, do some giveaways of some of those short stories as part of the uh, sign up for newsletters, things like that. And so I may have some uh, extra little giveaways coming up sometime later this year for that. OK. And if you're saying for your newsletter, where can they find you? <laughs> Well, let's see. One of the easiest ways is if you type johnmolson.blogspot.com. That will take you to my blog, and it's got a uh, giveaway and newsletter sign up on the top of it. Um, there are also links in there to other places like Goodreads and Twitter and Facebook. Uh, so I've got a presence uh, in all of those. Uh, if you can like remember what my face looks like and look me up on Facebook, there aren't too many John M. Olsons, but there's probably about a half a million John Olsons. So you have to be careful. <laughs> right so the best, the best, oh. Grand baby. Yeah. So the probably the best way from, to? The best way that you're saying to find you is actually go to your blog and use the links. Oh, yeah, that's probably the easiest way to do that. If you don't already have a connection to me on Facebook, then the blog works really well. Come on, okay. let's go back downstairs. <laughs> and uh, probably the other thing, too, is all your books are available on Amazon. Yeah, that's great. So we know where to find your books and where to find you. So I think that kind of wraps it up for us here. Um uh, so we've been talking with John Olson about his yeah, books, his a little bit about your career in a sense, uh, as a writer and uh, moving into other parts and working with the league. So if you have any questions about any of this, you know, feel free to shoot and I can always get back in touch with John or you can reach out to him personally through his blog or through his one of his social media sites. And thank you for joining us with this conversation. Well, it's been great talking to you, Dan. I look forward to seeing you at more conferences and stuff, since that seems to be where we run into each other the most. Yep. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Have a great night.